Uh, but after this, after Pope, it goes underground, and the next time it surfaces is, uh, is among the scientists. Liberty Hyde Bailey, in 1905, wrote a book entitled The Outlook to Nature. The grand old Cornell Dean described nature as the norm. And Bailey said, if nature is the norm, then the necessity for correcting and amending the abuses of civilization become boldly apparent by very contrast. And he continues, the return to nature affords the very means of acquiring the incentive and energy for ambitious and constructive work of a high order. That's Bailey in 1905 saying that. Later in 1915, Bailey's The Holy Earth was published. And here Bailey advances the notion that a good part of agriculture is to learn how to adapt one's work to nature. To live in right relation with his natural conditions is one of the first lessons that a wise farmer or anyone, any other wise man learned. Well, that was Bailey. Sir Albert Howard published an agricultural testament in 1940, and he called the forest. Look to the forest on how to farm, he says, for nature is the supreme farmer. Howard pointed out that the main characteristic of nature's farming can be summed up in a few words. Mother Earth never attempts to farm without livestock and she always raises mixed crops. Great pains are taken to preserve the soil and to prevent erosion. The mixed vegetable and animal wastes are converted into humus. There is no waste. The processes of growth and the processes of decay balance one another. Ample provision is made to maintain large reserves of fertility. The greatest care is taken to store the rainfall. Both plants and animals are left to protect themselves against disease. Now before Howard's later writings in 1929, J. Russell Smith's Tree Crops was published and he said farming should fit the land. So the question then becomes, how is it that we have the poets who recognize that when the human was up against it that nature was our best teacher and a small group of scientists did the same, did they form a succession or a series? Wendell Berry says they form a series. That is, there was a succession, but it was in the common culture. In other words, these people did not build on one another. The succession was carried along in the common or non-formal culture, and then out of that popped up these individuals, the poets and the scientists, forming a series. And so the, the, um, the challenge for us is to turn that series, that is to, to, to begin the succession. What we've done historically is deny the validity of this in our very assumptions. We've done that at the Land Institute with our um, uh, trying to develop an agriculture based on the way the prairie works. I won't go into that uh, now. There's some things at the back table that'll tell you how you might get to know about uh, more of that. But I want to illustrate what this can mean with a couple of ways of posing questions. In my book, New Roots for Agriculture, 1980, before that in a, the paper of 78, I asked the question, what will nature require of us? And uh, since that time, uh, I've realized there's a fundamental difference between what will nature require of us and what can we get away with? Too much of modern sustainable agriculture is based on what can we get away with. Another question is, what will nature help us do here?
contrast that with what clever manipulations and inventions can we come up with? You see the contrast between the two paradigms. What on nature, we, we begin with, what was here? The second, what will nature require of us here? And the third, what will nature help us to do here? Those last two, what we have historically said, what can we get away with? And what clever manipulations can we come up with? This currently characterizes too much of the sustainable agriculture work of today. So the farmer has to do with an ecological worldview. The latter has to do with that industrial mind. It's the difference between nature as the measure and smart resource management. If you're into smart resource management, you're in the wrong agenda. Because that then heaps too much upon human cleverness and assumes too much of our knowledge is adequate. Now, I, here's where I feel pretty confident about all of that. But now I want to talk to you about something that I feel somewhat less confident about, and here I ask the academies uh, generosity and sympathy uh, for some wild speculation. If we start with the way a native prairie works, or we could say a forest, but the way a native prairie works, and look at that as, human, as community ecology, and think about that informing a future agricultural research agenda. In the case of the work at the land where we have perennials grown in a polyculture the way a prairie does, except we're selecting for high seed yield to take advantage of the natural integrities inherent within the system. Is it in the cards for us because since that prairie features recycling of materials and running on sunlight and is community ecology, is it in the cards for us to think about applying those principles to human community? At what point do those principles break down? For after all, within a natural ecosystem community, we're talking about a diversity of species. Within a human community, a diversity of persons. We know that we're going to have to, I think the most exciting field for the next century is going to be accounting. <laughs> but ecological community accounting. Now, if we were to think about those principles that are at work within a natural ecosystem, we have to look to the way bills get paid and what the metrical devices are for keeping track within that system. We're talking about ecological community of behavior. So what I'm calling for is the bringing into the universities a second major. Right now universities have only one major to offer the student. It's upward mobility. We'll give you upward mobility if you come here. And they've been able to deliver. They've done a wonderful job delivering on upward mobility. What about offering a major in homecoming? I don't mean to necessarily go back to home, but go to a place and dig in and begin to educate the young using the paradigm of ecology to make them the pioneers in the resettling of America. The resettling of the small towns and rural communities, not as a matter of mere nostalgia, just to satisfy the Jeffersonian view as some kind of mere nostalgia, but as a practical necessity. Because after all, we've got to begin to think how we're going to run the planet on sunlight 
And nature's people are going to have to be dispersed across this landscape to do that. We don't dare send them out into the countryside with the mind of the extractive economy. If they do, they will be looking for one, way, one more way to bring in another industry to give jobs. We've got to go back with the idea of jobs that are of a sustainable nature. I'll tell you about a little project that I'm uh, sort of tentatively trying. In the Flint Hills of Kansas, uh, there is Chase County. It's the county that William Least Heat Moon wrote the book Prairie Earth about. And in that town is uh, Matfield Green. That, uh, in that county is Matfield Green. Now, 85% never plowed native prairie little over 3,000 people in the whole county, one stoplight, a blinker light, uh, where uh, 177 intersects 50. And uh, 38 people left in Matfield Green, and I've bought seven houses for less than $4,000. I'm sort of the Donald Trump of Matfield Green. <laughs> uh, some friends of mine and I bought uh, the school uh, with uh, 10,000 square feet for $5,000. And north of town, this is of course range country, 33 inches of rainfall though, uh, north of town uh, there's some old stockyards Santa Fe Railroad uh, had when they used to ship cattle. And south of town is an old booster station. Now, <clears throat> another friend of mine and I bought the 30 acres along with those cattle pens, not for, for not very much money, I'll tell you. Uh, he put in 90%, I put in 10%. It's what I call leverage. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what if we were on that range to begin to, instead of having the domestic bovine come in to those cattle pens, the bison. There are semi-domesticated bison now. You don't have to overwinter the bison with hay. Those bison could be slaughtered right there and the people in the town could work in this small slaughterhouse. As things now stand, Iowa beef packers, which is everywhere but Iowa, I think. Um, yeah. Iowa is, well, it, it, it's a minority. Uh, <laughs> Iowa beef packers uh, has a kill capacity of about eight million a year. There's a place in Emporia, Kansas, and these people are driving, some people driving 50 miles to work one way in order to get carpal tunnel syndrome. All right, uh, and also to give the American people a higher incidence of cancer of the lower bowel. All right, now we know that the, the domestic bovine is higher in fat, and it probably is higher in fat because it evolved in an agrarian climate when we had to work hard and we needed that fat. But the wild critters don't have as much fat, lower in cholesterol, and so on. So why should we not begin to bring back the bison that don't have to be overwintered, lower fossil fuel input, you don't put corn in them, uh, which it's nutty to have this cattle and pig welfare program anyway. 88% uh, of all vegetable protein in this country going into that program. It's the biggest welfare program in the history of the planet. And, then, and the cattle and the hogs can outbid people from Bangladesh any day. So why not have bison that uh, the people of the town could get the add-on value from and at the other end of town where the pumper station is shut down, why would that not be a good place to start assembling photovoltaic panels? So there would be the industrial answer to the extractive economy to nuclear power and so on. It's not to say there wouldn't be some problems from the processing of the uh, photovoltaics, but your ecological community accountant, your homecoming major from Iowa State could go back into a small town or a rural community not to be a blabbermouth to show how much he knows about organizing a community, but to be an ordinary citizen that was watchful and thoughtful and reflective and as a member of the community 
would begin, would keep the discussion alive about the extractive economy but plus the possibilities of a renewable economy carrying his ecological knowledge or her ecological knowledge. Now, as I said, that is, uh, that is somewhat, uh, the, the thinking isn't completely thought out there. What are we going to do? What are we going to do if we don't begin to develop the examples, the good examples that increase the imagination about possibilities? That's what it will mean to become native to this place. So far, we are carrying the mind more like that of the conqueror the mind of Columbus who came as a conqueror than the mind of the discoverer. We moved into the inner recesses of the atom, into the inner recesses of the cell. We went for longitude and latitude and altitude and so on. And what it is is the colonizing mind, the extractive mind that is at work. We don't know yet what it means to become, come home and we don't know where we are. We're still, to a large extent, as lost as Columbus was. We don't know where we are on this place and that's the beginning of a 500 year journey to figure out where we are. One of the things we'll have to do is to begin to welcome back the wild animals in order to know what it would become to, be, to become native to this place. And our becoming nativeness will become more, the, the models that we have will be more severely compromised as we get deeper and deeper into the so-called technological revolution. The only way we can move into that technological revolution with the kind of fervor and force that we have is, is with the assumption that our knowledge is adequate. And just here, last summer, is where I first asked the question. Given it was at a a, 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 a seminar for uh, philosophy of science or, and ethics and values, Gary Comstock. Uh, consider how long it took the chemists before they finally came up with a chemical that would destroy ozone. You can go back to the vulcanization of rubber in 1880s or when the work on the internal combustion engine was and, and uh, they're working with the fuels or you can come to right after World War I or you can come to um, 1946 let's say when the polymer era when they strung polymers together. <laughs> the point is the chemists finally did it. In other words rather than arguing back and forth all day long all year long, all decade long, whether this chemical is safe or that chemical is safe, built into the world view was the inevitability of something that would give us the ozone hole equivalent. Now here's my question. How long will it take the biotechnologists to come up with the ozone hole equivalent? What is the set of assumptions working with the modern biotechnologists that they can safely assure us that the ozone hole equivalent is not in the cards because that comes out of the world view of Bacon and Descartes. It does not come out of an ecological world view. Now, why did I come to community, human community? I come to human community because we're still fundamentally creatures of the upper Paleolithic. We're hardwired to be in the gathering hunting tribe with rather small numbers of people. And why community works is because of a long evolutionary past in which, first I'd say, community as civilization's upscaling of the tribe. Community works because it, because that's where we have spent so much of our evolutionary history. Community as a mystery and a metaphor, it seems to me, is the beginning of a kind of 
revitalization and a rediscovery. Let me give you a, an, an illustration of what I, I think a convenient way to think of this. Um, you can design a computer to do A, B, C, D, and E. And because it's able to do those functions, that computer can also do J, K, L, and M as a derivative. A human having its evolution developing the stereoscopic vision of the forest, the upright stance on the savanna, develops a neurophysiological anatomical way to walk and move, to run, and as a derivative of that, we can ride a bicycle. That's what we, riding the bicycle is something we, we do with ease. Once we learn how to do it, we know how to do it. But that is what I call a second order, or first order derivative of a primary activity. Now, the farther we move away from the first order derivatives, the more complicated things get for us. We did not evolve in nation states. If we had, there'd be no such thing as bureaucracy. See, that is, that's why we don't do that very well. So why should we look to that thing that is of a fifth order derivative in us for our solutions? Why not go with our long suit, which is we are creatures that can do things well in small groups, in communities, and begin to increase, increase the imagination about possibilities. After all, we know that it is in the small towns and rural communities of America that the seed stock for the American culture was developed and nurtured. And now we're losing that seed stock to the likes of Silicon Valley. And so children are growing up in shopping malls and Little League. And we've developed a Kmart mentality. We got a Kmart patriotism. We got Kmart religion. Instant gratification, cheap, easily accessible, and will let us down when we need it. Now, with that in mind, the homecoming major developed by Iowa State University and Kansas State University. I think you people can do it, Kansas can. Uh, it's because I don't know you people. <laughs> we always think the best of those that we don't know very well. <laughs> uh, but, but if we could begin to come to terms with what we might call this ecological worldview, and it's not that there's a total repudiation of reductionism, it's that it does not become our leading thrust, our leading metaphor. It's just that there's not a total repudiation of biotechnology, but it ought to follow and not lead. You see, it's, we're talking about a cultural landscape here that allows us to use our own heads instead of somebody else using our heads for us. Well, I, I had intended to be done by now, but I have about 35 more pages to go. Uh, let, me, let me just tell you one quick little thing. Uh, in Matfield Green, where I have these seven plush houses, all of them leak and uh, foundations falling away and so on, <clears throat> I've had great fun tearing off the porches and cleaning up the yards. It's been sad going through the abandoned belongings of families who lived out their lives in this beautiful, well-watered, fertile setting. In an upstairs bedroom, I recently came across a dusty but beautiful blue padded box labeled Old Programs of the New Century Club. Most of the programs from 1923 to 1964 were there. Each listed the officers the club flower, which was the sweet pea, the club colors, pink and white, and the club motto, just be glad. <laughs> the programs for each year are under one cover and nearly always dedicated to some local woman who's special in some way. One month, the women were to comment on such categories as canning, jokes, 
memory gems, a magazine article, guest poems, flower culture, misused words, birds, and so on. The May 36 program was a debate. Resolved that movies are detrimental to the young generation. <laughs> the August 1936 program was dedicated to coping with the heat. Roll call was hot weather drinks. Next on the program was suggestions for hot weather lunches, and the program by Mrs. Rogler was ways of keeping cool. The June roll call in 29 was the disease I fear most. <laughs> this is 11 years after the great flu epidemic. Children still dying then of diphtheria, whooping cough, scarlet fever, and pneumonia. On August 20, the roll call question was, what do you consider the most essential to good citizenship? The roll call September that year was birds of our country. The program was on the morning dove. What became of it all? From 1923 to 1930, there were beautiful program covers done at a print shop. From there on until 37, the reality of the depression is apparent. Programs were either typed or mimeographed, there was no cover. The programs for two years were missing, but in 1940, the covers reappeared, but this time typed on construction paper. The print shop printing never appeared again. The last program in the box was 1964. I don't know the last year Mrs. Johnson attended the club. I do know that Mrs. Florence Johnson and her husband Turk celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary for in the box are some beautiful white 50th anniversary napkins with golden bells and the names Florence and Turk between the years 1920 and 1970. Mrs. Johnson died in 81. The school had closed in 67. The lumber yard closed in 77, the hardware store 48, 49, and the gas station. But back to those programs. The motto never changed. The sweet pea kept it standing. And so did the club colors of pink and white. The club collect, which I want to read to you, persisted month after month, year after year. Here it is. A collect for club women. Keep us, O oh God, from pettiness. Let us be large in thought, in word, in deed. Let us be done with fault-finding and leave off self-seeking. May we put away all pretense and meet each other face to face without self-pity and without prejudice. May we never be hasty in judgment and always generous. Let us take time for all things. Make us grow calm, serene, gentle. Teach us to put, our, put into action our better impulses, straightforward and unafraid. Grant that we may realize it is the little things that create differences that in the big things of life we are as one. And may we strive to touch and to know the great common woman's heart of us all. And oh, Lord God, let us not forget to be kind. By modern standards, these people were poor. When these women and their club left this earth, the extractive or industrial economy scarcely noticed. It was the same when the school closed and the hardware store and lumber yard. There was a kind of naivete among these relatively unschooled women. Some of their poetry is not good. Some of their ideas about the way the world works seem silly. Some of their club programs don't sound very interesting. Some sound tedious but their monthly agendas were filled with decency, coping with the weather and diseases, learning about everything from the birds to our government. These women were living up to a far broader spectrum of their potential than most of us today. Now, I'm not suggesting we go back to 1923 or even to 64, but I will say that those people 
in that particular generation in places like Matfield Green, and you can think of them here in Iowa, those people were farther along in the necessary journey to become natives to their places even as they were losing ground than we are today. The question becomes why was this livelihood so vulnerable to the industrial economy? And what can we do to protect such attempts to be good and decent and live out our lives responsibly? I don't know. But that ought to be the agenda of Iowa State University to find that out. Because if Iowa State University doesn't, and Harvard doesn't, and Yale doesn't, we've had it. We've had it as a culture. When the things run down to the sea that we're made of, the soil, when the water is polluted and the air is foul and our children have no hope about living out healthful and productive lives and we have run the gamut in relying primarily on knowledge as adequate, then there will be a whale. There will be a whale. And what will they have to turn back to if we don't have the good examples that they can turn to? Well, I'll end with a poem. Gary Snyder, For the Children. We know the population curve is like this. Now it's in the exponential. It's predicted that soon the ozone hole will be in the exponential. Global warming is here, so they say. So think of these steep slopes, these curves, as I read this poem by Gary Snyder for the children. The rising hills, the slopes of statistics lie before us. The steep climb of everything going up, up as we all go down. In the next generation or the one beyond that, they say our valleys, pastures, we can meet there in peace. To climb these coming crests, one word to you, to you and your children. Stay together. Learn the flowers. Go light. I thank you.